What's up, my ninjas? I'm Strident, and I am finally back with the review of The Dark Knight Returns Part 2. I am going to keep this straight to the point. The first one, it was easily in my top five Batman movies of all time. I would say it's number two or... You know, it's, it's number, maybe number three. This will be number two. Number one is uh, Under the Red Hood. This easily smashes the live action movies. If they can't give us a Batman like this in live action, we're, we, we need to stop going to see those films. This is the Batman. This is the kind of Batman that we've been wanting to see. Um, th this picks up immediately where the last one left off. Joker is pretty much sitting in uh, Arkham, listening to the, uh, someone switched the channels and he's hearing about Batman on every channel. People are complaining, and each time they say his name, he stands up a little bit straighter. He starts stuttering. When he, he hears Batman again, and he's like, bat, bat, Batman, darling. And it cuts, that's the end. This one picks up right after that, where he's sitting there, he's watching, he's glued to the screen, he manipulates his uh, uh, um, his therapist to actually let him come on TV to tell his side of the story. Any one of us who knows the Joker, we know what's about to happen. Joker commits an atrocity. Batman comes out to stop him, but has to deal with the police force that is now led by Ellen Yendel, the new commissioner. Um, we get a cool showcase of... Uh, Batman's skills now that he's fully embraced his uh, you know his, his role as being Batman again he's wearing the black and gray and he is beating the shit out of these cops I mean doing fancy things with their nightsticks um, these crazy counters I mean he's really giving it to him um, but he is too late to stop what the Joker does because he's too busy dealing with the cops so you're seeing that, you know, times are a little bit more, uh, you know, things are rough for Batman because now the cops want him. He's got to deal with whatever criminals pop up and his, you know, he's old. Um, that is your intro to what turns into another, like, <laughs> epic hit as far as Batman stories go. Now, many of us already know that this is one of the penultimate Batman stories. A lot of people have issues with Frank Miller, but this was before he went crazy. This was when he was thinking of, how do you take this character who, uh, he's such a goody good, but he is kind of dark. How do you take that and amplify it and show us what he could be like, you know what I mean? And he made this story that just crafted, it, it turned Batman into like a, a soldier, like a hardcore, I don't know, it's the darkness that we're seeing in everything these days. Anyway, this particular portion of the story, it gets dark, it gets nasty, it gets crazy. Easily the most uh, mature of all of the, um, the DC animated uh, films. Easily. I mean, it's the most violent. Um, some of the situations are kind of like, damn. I mean, uh, the, the Spectre kind of, it got that creepy kind of mature feeling as well. But... Um, it didn't go as far as this did. This takes it there. I mean, there's so much blood, especially in comparison to anything else Batman related. You thought there was blood in the first, um, <laughs> The Dark Knight Returns Part 1? Woof, you didn't see shit. Um, we get to see the final confrontation between Batman and the Joker, and believe you me, this thing kicks the shit out of everything else we've seen. It's better than what we saw with um, Heath and... Uh, uh, Bail. You, we, you thought that that was cool. You know, a lot of people keep talking about how the Joker in those that movie was so amazing. It, it pales in comparison to this Joker. This is the Joker. This is pretty much since it's ten years in the future. Joker has been out of the game for the same ten years. Batman has been out of the game, and the only thing that could bring him out of the game is the appearance of Batman. So believe you, believe you me, when he shows up. The ante is automatically upped. He just starts killing, and it doesn't stop. He's manipulating people. He's killing people. I mean, it's the Joker, straight up, with no questions, no nothing. He's hamming up his 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 uh, 
performance, and it's pretty cool because it feels almost this in the in the same in a similar vein as uh, Jack Nicholson, just not as physically over the top. Joker's not dancing around and stuff like that. It's the things he says and how he says it, you know, how he emotes and stuff like that. It feels like Nicholson's Joker because Heath didn't do any of that stuff. Um, but you get. <laughs> The Joker um, massacres gobs of people. They said in the first, his first scene as the Joker, fully dressed up, lipstick and everything, he kills 200 people. In the next one, he goes through a carnival and slays folks, just shooting them, popping them. You know, excuse me, coming through, pop, 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 my bad, pop, pop, watch out, pop, pop. It's like he just lost it completely, and you already know Joker is bonkers. The way the fight ends, is crazy i mean if you've read the book before this isn't a surprise but to see it in motion it kind of it, it beyond does it justice even the uh actually the actual line work the drawings and the animation as the the situation escalates the art gets so much more detailed and intricate and the creepy things are accentuated to the point where it, it just burns the image into your head literally um or into your subconscious or your memory or whatever. It's just well done and well directed. Jay Oliver, he he deserves lots of props for this. Um, the voice acting, it's completely on point. Everybody does their part. Everybody does a good job. Nobody sucks. Everybody is on point. Their game is up. Michael Emerson, who plays the Joker, he does an awesome job. At first, I didn't think I was going to really like this guy. I mean, I, I heard him as uh, Dr. Venom on um, G.I. Joe Renegades, but, um, you know, it didn't really stand out to me. So I was just like, wow, they just picked this random dude? Like, why? But he does a really good job for an older Joker who I guess is not necessarily trying to put on an act like before. He was so, uh, he just was crazy and creepy. Like, the, the regular Joker kind of has fun with what he does. And we kind of, you know, as the audience, we kind of see the fun and we we kind of enjoy seeing him have fun, even though he's doing really hein heinous things. Um, this Joker, he was extremely direct. He, It's like that the time for goofing off and having fun, so to speak, is gone. Now we're going to focus on killing people. And that's precisely what he did. He just killed up a whole bunch of people. Um, but... Everything that you get to see in this film, you see Batman hold a gun, you see easily the most violent confrontation uh, in animation of uh, between the Joker and uh, Batman. Um, you get to see the cops coming after Batman as if he is a criminal, like more so than we've seen in other animations. Um, just the caliber of animation, just the tone of the film. It's extremely mature. Lots of blood, lots of situations where they normally would have probably cursed. So they kind of find a way to, excuse me, to uh, uh, work around that and just elude to what, what you know the response would be. Um, it just, I don't know, man. It, it, was, it was amazing. And uh, <clears throat> the very end of the, um, of the whole thing, uh, you see uh, <laughs> everything builds up to this climactic, epic, unforgettable battle between Batman and Superman. Um, Batman, of course, has Carrie Kelly at his side, and there's a little guest appearance by the Green Arrow, another one of my favorite characters. And uh, there's a lot of talk about um, what happened in the past, I guess, to shut down the Justice League and all of that stuff. And they don't really go into detail about it, which is kind of cool because you can it leaves it to any of our little geeky, dorky imaginations where we could come up with the reason why, uh, you know, the the the... Justice League would be disbanded. And judging from what you're seeing, the president is giving orders to Superman. So Superman <laughs> is uh, 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 kind of, he's, he's in a sense betraying what a lot of the superheroes have been standing for. The whole point of superheroes in the DC universe is to do the things that the government can't. You know, to stand up for people in a way that the government will not. But when the poster boy for superheroes starts working directly for the government 
you kind of have directly for the president, you know, almost like his little black ops, like a one man black ops squad that the president gets to mobilize. It's kind of a, um, a kick in the nuts, you know, to the rest of the league. Um, some of uh, this usage of Superman as a weapon leads to uh, the fallout of a, of a uh, what do they call it, of an EMP from a nuke. Um, blacking out Gotham. During the blackout, the newly formed uh, Sons of Gotham are just, they're going nuts. More gangs have popped up since uh, the Batman took down the mutant gangs. And uh, you have looting and you have all kinds of craziness. You know how it is, riots, all that. Because now people can get, they think they can get away from it. So it's up to Commissioner Gordon, a handful of other people, and Batman and uh, Robin to get shit back in order. So uh, they kind of uh, round up the Sons of Gotham and turn them into a militia to go and protect the streets and keep order and help keep all this crazy shit to a minimum so that the police can actually do what they need to do and the emergency service units can actually help who they need to help. When Ellen Yindel sees this, she kind of backs off because she realizes that Batman is a force for good. Even though some of his methods are questionable, he is that gray area in our justice system, essentially, where you can be a vigilante and, you know, murder criminals, but you still can help the people at large and be an inspiration to them. You don't have to necessarily be a 100% psychopath because of your taking a stand against people way worse than, you know, you, you know, and you killing those people, you know? So, um, you know, I hope that made sense. <laughs> um, pretty much, you know, vigilantism has its ups and its downs, and she's seeing more of the ups with Batman than the downs. Um, so she, the cops don't attack Batman during this time. But, like I said, the president, who is funny, is uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, because Reagan was in office when this, um, the book was written, um, or you could say in this alternate United States, he was, you know, the president at the time. Um, he orders Superman to go and stop Superman or Batman because Batman's getting out of hand and, you know, he's making everyone else look bad because he's standing up against authority and he's taking everything into his hands and he's writing everything. He's fixing Gotham himself with, with his own tactics, with everything the way he wants to do it. And this makes the government officials in various, you know, offices look horrible it makes the state's um officials look horrible it makes the police officials look horrible it makes military officials look horrible so they're just like fuck it we got to go down there and essentially declare martial martial law and take over and get batman out of there and you know batman's not having that shit so we get the freaking legendary battle between batman and superman batman is wearing an exosuit and uh whoo man I thought the fight between Batman and Superman that was in uh, uh, Brave and the Bold that kind of mimicked the Dark Knight uh, Returns, I thought that was nice. This takes it to a whole nother level. I mean, the two of them throw down with no regard. Batman throws everything at him. It's better than the fight in the book. And uh, whew, everything that happens during this fight is just gold. It's just well thought out. The enhancements on the, the attacks that were thrown, well thought out, well executed, well shot. They chose the perfect direction for all of these attacks and counters and for how you see Batman take the damage that he takes and how you see him survive the damage that he takes and all the preparations that were made. You, It just, it's, it's epic as fuck. And you know me, if it's epic, <laughs> if it's epic, it, it, it hits me in my heart. And it makes me fucking happy. And it, it, it reminds me of why I am into superheroes in the first place. I mean, it's been a while since I got to see something with superheroes. You know, since freaking Justice League Unlimited. It's been a long time since I saw something where they got the way the superheroes act properly. I mean, some will argue that Superman is such a dick in this. But you have to remember, it's ten years that Batman hasn't been around. And... The government, they must have taken, he must have started working for the government before that, you know? But, uh, man, 
Man, man, man. This, this movie is worth being in your collection. Uh, if you love superheroes, it's worth it. Um, I know I just, I ranted like a motherfucker telling you all the little details and everything of this plot. Well, I didn't tell you all of them, but the general overview. But just know, every time Batman fights, it's amazing. From the opening sequence to the very last fight. Amazing. It's the kind of fighting that we wanted and it's, it's possible to do in live action. You know, we watch Jet Li films. We watch all the Jason Bourne films. We've seen so many movies where people fight in a more complex manner than what we saw in the Dark Knight trilogy. And that was what was being passed off as Batman. That's the realistic version of Batman. And he wasn't even capable of doing a third of the shit we see in this. And this is old Batman. Batman at like, what, 60? Late 50s, something like that? This is geriatric Batman. He could kick the shit out of the Dark Knight trilogy Batman. And, you know, I, I said it in that previous review. Nolan said that this was one of his primary inspirations. Now, when you watch this, you all you'll see when you watch these two movies together is that there are lines that Nolan stole and situations that he stole for his movie. But what happens in this version versus what happens in that version, it's like Nolan doesn't understand the concept of truly epic filmmaking, you know, or epic storytelling. Not in that, in this context, you know. You saw it in uh, Inception. There were some scenes that were just pretty epic, you know. You saw it in uh, The Prestige, pretty epic shit, but in a movie that it warranted that kind of, uh, feel and that kind of uh, approach we get dumbed down and I don't think that that's what was ne it's not needed for Batman it's a superhero movie you know what I'm saying so when you watch this and you see all this stuff unfold in front of you it's shown to you in such vivid uh, with such vivid and uh, 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 visceral direction that you could see this in a live action film shot exactly the same way. All the shots are possible. If you think hard enough and if you've watched enough movies, you've seen these certain elements of these scenes in other movies shot almost the same way. Just the subject matter was different as in like who was getting punched or who was running and bleeding and who was jumping on cars. You know what I'm saying? Like the characters were different. But the situation was there. And I've watched a lot of movie, I've, movies. I've seen a lot. I own a ton of movies. I own... I can't... This is like my second collection because I was robbed once and someone stole all my fucking movies. But I think I have now more movies than I had then. And this is my second time around collecting films all over again. And this, is, this was years ago. This was over 10 years ago that I got robbed. And in the 10 years afterwards, I have built up another collection of a lot of what I had and a lot of new stuff because a lot of good stuff has come out since then. Um, but even before that and even in between that, I have seen a lot of movies. I've seen a ton of movies. I've researched a ton of movies. I, I've read a ton of scripts. And I said all of that, all about all these movies that I saw, the scripts I've read, etc., the collection, all of this to say that I have seen enough that supports that this film could be done in live action. All that would have to happen is that the director would have to be as dedicated to the project as Frank Miller was to write, writing and drawing it as a comic. Kind of like Sin City. It would have to be done in that kind of you know format, that kind of feel to it. Um, and then they'd have to have the balls to tweak things and not just put it in there for the sake of saying that it's 100% accurate to the book. But all that aside, you know, that's, that's a discussion for a whole nother day because other people are going to say it say different things about it but i am so happy that they made this film and they made it animated and they did it to the level that they did it to because any other way that th this couldn't have been done right you know what i'm saying it couldn't have been done right by anybody else and they did it to the t and it felt like they were trying to send a message to <laughs> nolan and his people because you know he threw around names that would get the dorks and the nerds and the geeks all excited, but he didn't actually do those things justice if you really pay attention to it. And I feel this uh, adaptation does it justice in, on every level. My only gripe with the film is there are a couple spots in the movie 
where things kind of just happen to make everything more difficult for Batman so that you don't feel that Batman is omnipotent. Uh, example, the first example is when in the beginning when he fights off Ellen Yindel and her uh, police department, um, he, uh, he beats like 20, you, you see a, a far shot, a wide shot of the rooftop. And then they cut to a couple closer shots where you get to see that there are about 20 cops up there, including Yindel. Batman shows up, takes out about 20 cops, maybe 15 if you want to be really critical. 15 of them. And Yindel and a couple cops are sitting up on a elevated portion of the rooftop, like with steps and everything. But then when the sm Batman throws down a smoke bomb, runs through, beats the shit out of all those guys, I gotta say he at least takes down 14 people. Then he gets up to the top. When the smoke clears, there's still 20 cops. And you're like, really? There's another scene during the fight with Joker. Um, or after the fight with Joker. Joker has shot a whole bunch of people. Um, a whole bunch of cops have died. Batman's blown up cops. He's beat up cops. He's run through stuff. You know, um, all this stuff has happened. And you keep seeing the, the, the number of cops dwindle. But then when... Yindel shows up again there's way more cops you know um, stuff like that gets on my nerves because I understand they could have a, a whole police department and call for backup but those are details that usually even in comic books they show you there'll be a tiny panel where someone calls for backup or the word bubble will be pointing to someone in the background saying you know we need backup um, same shit goes for um, in these films usually you would see someone grab their walkie-talkie and say, we need backup, you know? All units report to such and such location, uh, shots have been fired, etc., etc. Instead, you just got this, this magical teleportation of cops, you know what I mean? I know it's a cartoon and it's me being harsh, but I prefer when things are kept in perspective. If this is Batman and he's finally lost it in the sense that you know how he had a uh, one of his his moral ideals was not to kill, and he finally had the revelation that in order to bring justice to his city, he's going to have to kill. You know, he starts killing these you know guys. He doesn't necessarily kill the cops, but he's not holding back on them. You know, he's slapping them just as hard as he's slapping the villains. He's throwing explosives at them. Everything. It should show. The cops should be like, fuck, I don't want to deal with Batman. Cops should be running in the other direction. But instead, I mean, and they had some scenes like that. Don't get me wrong. They did have a couple scenes like that. So this is not a 100% all across the board uh, assessment. This is just in the two scenes I'm talking about. There shouldn't be that easy fill in the blank. We need more pressure on Batman. So let's make more shit come at him by conveniently having cops who are not afraid of him, just show up so that he can make them afraid of him. You know, it's like after you solidify that most people in Gotham are afraid of Batman, it's kind of hard for, for you know, intelligent viewers to, to look at it and say, oh, if everyone's afraid of Batman, cop and, you know, crook alike, why are these police officers trying to hit him after they just showed us one guy was practically peeing on himself because he didn't want to take on Batman? And Yindel had to say something to him. And he still probably didn't want to take on Batman, you know? I've played games where, like, like the Punisher. When the Punisher shows up, usually at least one out of five of the villains will drop his weapon and just put his hands up. And the rest of them will be stupid, and you kill them. And usually the guy who doesn't fight you has information that you need to know. Sometimes it's just a random, uh, 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 I won't say NPC, but a random enemy. So, you know, this, this should work. I mean, it's one of the things that I wanted in Arkham City that wasn't there, but it's one of those things that just should be. And sometimes it does pop up in Arkham City, actually, now that I think about it. But anyway, that was my minor criticism. Everybody's performances were awesome. All the art was awesome, especially in the more uh, dramatic scenes, like the Joker, his final fight, and uh, the fight between Batman and Superman. It's just amazing amazing well done it kicks the shit out of every almost every batman movie that we've seen before that there's two batman movies that are up there with this and that is 
Return of the Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, then Under the Red Hood, and then these two. And I would even put these two above uh, uh, Return of the Joker. Return of the Joker just has this one spot in it that is so epic. It's like, like, like epic movie making that it deserved to be put in the theater. I guess the reason why they didn't do that is because they knew that kids would go see the movie and be freaked out, and parents would complain and it'd be a shitstorm, and you know. But I don't know that that scene, and you guys know what I'm talking about with Little J. That shit is amazing, and that puts that movie way up there. Um, Under the Red Hood, there's not too much else that can be said. It showed you Batman like better than we've seen him in the past, you know. Um, he fought better, he was methodical, his detective skills were up, and you got a lot of drama. Then this, you get drama, and you get Batman just going ham on people, and this is what we've been wanting to see for a while, especially after that watered-down mess that was the Dark Knight trilogy. So anyway, I'm Strident. This movie is pure win. Check it out. You need to check this out if you haven't seen it. Um, Everybody who's seeing it in all kinds of other ways, if you get to see an advanced screening, turn around and buy it. We need to support this because this is animation that it's becoming a minority in, in the entertainment field. Hand-drawn animation with a couple nuanced uh, you know, CG animated things in the backgrounds. But we need to keep two-dimensional hand-drawn animation alive because everything can't just be CG. CG is one tool in an artist's, uh, you know, uh, palette or in his toolbox, if you want to say, you know, it's one color that he can paint with, but it shouldn't be the only color that everything is painted with. And we need to keep this shit alive. So anyway, I'm Strident. That's my story and I'm sticking to it and I'm out. I will see you on the next vid. Peace.